I would like to share my screen with you this evening, uh, if that's all right, just for the while, um, because we are going to be talking uh, about some things that might have a visual reference for it. Um, I would like to start by saying thank you to the Lit and Phil for the opportunity to, um, to speak with you tonight about my work. Um, as Kay noted, I'm a PhD candidate at Newcastle University in my third year. Um, I've had a long fascination with the 19th century ever since I discovered Sherlock Holmes as a youth. Um, and so it's really probably not surprising that my research focuses on that, that period. Um, my, my research came about in part because of uh, one of those little questions that you might get in an online survey, uh, or in my case, it was a student that asked me the question. Um, and that was, if you could have five people that would come to dinner from, from any point in history, who, what five people would you, would you invite to, to come over for dinner? Um, and, and because I spent a lot of time in my undergraduate period, uh, really obsessed with the medieval, medieval period of the Middle Ages, um, my first thought was I want to talk to Dante because I think he had a really interesting life um, and I would like to know what he quite thought about being exiled. Um, and of course, I wanted to talk to Geoffrey Chaucer as one of the great uh, poets of, of the English language ever. But the third person that I really wanted to talk to um, was, was a little bit of a surprise perhaps to, to the student because what I said is I wanted to talk to uh, a very typical middle-class housewife from about the 1850s or 1860s. Um, and, you know, this is one of those points in time where the, that's something that gets lost very easily in, in the past is that kind of everyday experience. And that's why in the slide, the woman is, is facing away, all right? Her, we don't know a whole lot about herself, her life. We have theories and, and we have some, uh, some data, but there's not been a lot of study on what the everyday life would be like for this person. Um, and so that's the basis of my project. In my conversation with this anonymous woman, uh, I might want to ask her how she felt about her home life, uh, how she saw herself within the middle class of the period, uh, and, and what some of her worries and, and daily problems were, because those are the ephemeral things of time that tend to so easily slip away and, and leave us um, unsure. And, and that's where this project is coming from. Um, there are several words in the, the title of this project that need to be parsed out a little bit more carefully uh, because those words make a tremendous impact on how, how we can make sense of this. And one of those words, of course, is the idea of home. Uh, now we know what home is. We, we probably are in one, we spent a lot of time there. Uh, in, in the, during the pandemic. Um, but the approach that I took to, to get to daily life of, of middle-class people in the 19th century started from something called a domestic guide. Uh, this was a, a tremendously prolific genre of literature from throughout the 19th century, uh, guides being published certainly from, from 1800 onward well into the, the 20th century, um, my work has identified that in that time period, there were at least 343 distinct titles on domestic economy that were published. Uh, and that's only focusing on those guides that were specifically talking about how to run and operate a home and excluding more than 280 other guides that could be considered uh, domestic guides on things like servants, uh, childcare, etiquette. So there was a lot of material that was that was presented on, on how to make a home, how to run a home. Um, and in some cases, these, these guides were, were very popular. Uh, you may have heard of Cassell's Household Guide or, or Isabella Beaton's uh, Guide to Household Management. Some of them uh, were published to, to several editions, in some cases, dozens of editions, uh, and some of them were still being printed well into the 20th century. So this is my starting point. And one of the things that we need to, to take on board with this is that a common critique uh, for historians is that domestic economy guides are aspirational in nature. And by that, what I mean is 
they were meant to be the equivalent of uh, a better homes magazine or a Martha Stewart type of, of guide, most homes might not have the resources to be able to, to do what these guides were, were talking about. And there is some truth to that because of the nature of the studies uh, that have been done about the 19th century home so far. A lot of the studies in 19th century homes have focused on either the architecture of the home or commodities within the home, right? the things that make up a home. But, and there's a reason for that. It's a very valuable thing to do because they still exist. We can go into a 19th century house. I, I'm in something that was built about 1895 and, and that's not uncommon. So we can look at the floor plan. We can walk through and imagine the space. Uh, there are plenty of objects that exist in, in homes and in antique shops that we can work with. But there's a critical element that is missing from these because uh, they assume that that was the important part. And, and I would like to bring into the conversation something completely different because my work focuses on emotions. Uh, uh, and you know, here we have a, a lovely image uh, of Queen Victoria taken in her last tour of, of Ireland. She's smiling. It's a, rare, it's a rare image to see Queen Victoria smiling. And this is, this is a point that we need to consider in terms of emotions, because emotions history is a relatively new thing uh, in, in terms of history, but it's not really its own separate field. Since the 1950s, 1960s, there has been a, a, a rise of history from Below, that is to say, looking at the history of the everyday people, as opposed to previous studies in um, politics, the great men of history, etc. Emotions history is part of that. It's a subfield, but it's not its own separate thing. It has to operate. Emotions history has to operate within certain restrictions, though. Okay, and one of the key things that that we have to deal with is the fact that emotions are ephemeral and they are strictly internal. And that's where our picture of Queen Victoria comes in. We have an image of a smile and we make an assumption based on a smiling person that that person is feeling a particular way. They are experiencing some kind, experiencing some kind of emotional state that, that we, as we think is you know, probably happiness, okay, enjoyment, something like that. The fact of the matter is we don't know. Okay, and you, you don't know, somebody, when somebody says, I feel happy, and you say to them, I know how you feel, the fact is you don't, because the actual experience of emotion is inside your brain, and it is strictly yours. You think you know what happy is, and you think that you and, you and the other person share that experience of happy, but that's not necessarily true. So I'm not trying to say that I can recreate the, the emotional experiences of the past. The emotion historians don't do that. What we can say and what we can do is that we can address how people recorded that they felt or how they think they should have felt about something in the past. And that's an important distinction, but it's still a very useful tool to get at the daily experiences of, of, of people's lives. Um, the way I set out to do this is to construct uh, initially in this project in emotions lexicon, uh, a, a set of words that are in play to, uh, I'm looking for something, there it is. I'm, I'm about to put something in the chat and that's what I was looking for. I'm sorry, that was not terribly polished, but um, the emotions lexicon draws from a sampling of those domestic economy guides, looking at where emotions about the home were were, were used uh, and talked about to say, this is how home should feel. And this data is available to you. So in the chat, I'm, I'm putting a link. Um, this is a link to the Newcastle University data repository. Uh, and, and it contains the data and the summary for this emotions lexicon. And it, it is a data file, so it's not exactly engaging reading, but uh, it, may, it may be of interest to someone really wants to look into um, the kinds of emotion words that were in play. The, the main point for this though, was to try and make sure that uh, 
a higher sense of what the actual emotional language was associated with the home as based on a prescriptive sense of it. And there were some common patterns. Um, there were some good words, you know, a home typically was associated with cheer, uh, with happiness. Uh, and and there, there were also, some, I mean, there's some great Victorian emotions words. Vexation is one we should probably bring back vexation. It's a good word. Um, so this emotions lexicon provides a, a starting point for me to dig into the lived experiences of, of the middle class. And that's the, that's the starting point for this project then. So emotion is one of those words we really need to define as well as the home. Um, another issue is concerning the question of middle class. Um, the middle of anything is really, really difficult to define. All right. You have to know where the starting and ending points are in order to get any sense of what the middle is going to be. And in the 19th century, in terms of class, uh, that's, a, that's a much harder thing to do than you might think. So I, I relied on an idea that goes way, way back in, in terms of social history. Uh, if you've ever heard of a man named E.P. Thompson, he wrote a book called The Making of the English Working Class. And, and Thompson's work asserts that class is a relationship. It, it does not exist on its own. It can only exist in relationship to other things. And, and so that was a starting point to try and address the question of class for this work. But I wanted to go further because even within that relationship, the middle class of the 19th century is really difficult to define. The, the upper end is, is relatively clear. That is to say, there are distinct markers of what the aristocracy and largely the gentry are supposed to be like. And so that, that represents the top end of where the middle class should probably stop. But on the lower end, it's, it's much harder to sort out where exactly somebody stops being in the working class and moves to the middle class because most of the markers that you could bring into that are, um, they are not particularly clear because they can change based on, on the context that you wish to use. For example, uh, an income-based marker of how much, how much money am I earning is not a particularly good class marker in the 19th century as the middle class tended, especially on the lower end, tended to have very marginalized wages compared to somebody who was very successful in the working class, such as a railroad engineer. So that doesn't particularly work. You could talk about it in terms of uh, other things like taste, like habits, but all of these ha have their faults. And so um, I chose to do something new with, with my work. Uh, and I think it's one of the most innovative bits of, of the study at this point. Uh, I've, this may be more than you need to know about class relationship, but, but what I did is I brought in something called actor network theory. Uh, and the premise for that is that rather than suppose that there is a defined standard of this is a predefined class and now we're going to just figure out what the markers are that go in it, it turns the problem around. And it says that uh, we're going to look at a group of people. We're going to figure out what the markers are that these people have, whether that is a question of taste or income or housing or uh, question decor, how they dress, take your pick. And then using those, we're going to say, now how do these people identify themselves? And, and that becomes a way to define the group. And in this case, what we have is a relationship where the middle class in the 19th century did position themselves in between the working class and the aristocracy or the upper classes. Um, but they also tried to position themselves very much amongst themselves. There was a lot of self-modification for the middle class in terms of what constituted being in the middle class. And, and that has a, a particular role in the home because the, the home was the place where a lot of middle class values played out. Um, 
so for our purposes in this study, class, the middle class of the 19th century, is the group that says they are the middle class, and this is what they're doing to try and make themselves be middle class, rather than presupposing that there is some ready-made entity of, of middle classness in play. Um, there's also a question of the British pop, okay? And, and there's several points on this. Um, you, if you're familiar with the period at all, you may know that the, the English home was particularly singled out as a point of importance. Um, the book that you can see on the side, The Gentleman's House, was written by Robert Kerr, uh, and, and he was quite direct about his opinions on this. What we in England call a comfortable house is a thing so intimately identified with English customs as to make us apt to say that in no other country but our own is this element of comfort fully understood, or at all events, that the comfort of any other nation is not the comfort of this. Only England knows what a comfortable home should be. This does not mean everybody agreed with him. Um, there was a, a writer from 1833 from the continent, Baron de Hesso, who noted uh, in the middle classes, Comfort means a heavy, well-stuffed armchair in which the master of the house goes to sleep after dinner. You think I jest? No, verily, it is the exact truth. Independently of this chair, there is nothing which justifies the idea of just general comfort, which the word would seem to indicate. And then he goes on to critique uh, several elements of the home, including uh, bland English food and smoking chimneys. That doesn't mean that the idea did not persist. It, it held on quite strongly throughout the entire 19th century. Um, other writers of domestic guides latched onto the sense of what an English home should be. Miss Wigley, uh, in her book, Our, Ho Our Homework, Manual of Domestic Economy, written in 1876, uh, wrote, the love of home exists in every heart that is worth calling by that name, but in no nation, in any part of the world is this love more perfectly developed than in England. We look to find our best and purest joys at our own fires. And that idea definitely took hold for a lot of people. Um, there was even potentially an imperialistic element to this English sense of home. There was a, a book called How to Furnish a House and Make it a Home that suggested whether the Englishman be dwelling within the bounds of his native land in the wilds of Australia, in the forests of America, or the scorching plains of India, he knows the meaning of home and feels its value. So this, this idea of home as a pivotal place is an essential component of 19th century life, and the middle class were keenly aware of that. And, and I want to make it clear too that, that this kind of rhetoric very much did take hold in people's minds particularly, I was surprised about this, but particularly children, uh, younger people latched onto this in, in some of the things that they wrote in, in private letters or, or even uh, if they did keep a diary. There was a girl uh, age 12 named Mary Ferguson writing to her mother while she was on holiday. Uh, and Mary wrote, uh, how delighted I will be to be with you again in our own dear home. Many sweet hours have I passed there and many more I look forward to. Um, another woman named Catherine Marshall, uh, a, a young girl, I don't know exactly her age at the time she wrote the letter, it's not, it's not documented, but she, she got a letter, she sent a drawing to her uncle, and the uncle wrote back uh, commenting on what a lovely home she had drawn and, and some of the features of the home, so these, these are really important things for the home, and, and, and you're quite right to see all that out. Um, so, the English sense of home is, is quite a strong one, but my study is going beyond that and, and wants to look at the British home, which is to say Britain, Great Britain is of course Scotland, England, and Wales. Um, I chose not to go into Ireland at this point because there are enough other differences that it, I thought it would just be complicated. Um, and so, this image, all right, what you see on the slide, it's, it's a lovely image, isn't it? You know, we've got, this is around Christmas time. This was actually a, a Christmas card from, from late in the period. And we have the family around the fire. We've got the cat, we've got the dog, we've got the children, the, the dutiful family gathered in happiness. 
This is, this is that lingering ideal. This has been with us for, well, since the 19th century. And it, it still persists in, in the public image, uh, you know, our mindset in the 19th century. And it's a lovely English image, except that the first description of this is from a Scottish guy. And I think that's a kind of an exciting point. Um, and I want to clarify that, what I'm saying, because uh, there is an asterisk next to that, okay? In 1842, a man named John Ayton wrote in a guide specifically of domestic economy for uh, ministers in Scotland. He wrote, there is something extremely cheerful sitting around a good fire, especially if there's a, a piece of light coal blazing in front of it. Uh, sides the minister at one side, the mother at the other, and the bairns among their feet amusing themselves with the two cats or with their favorite dog forms as happy a group as the world can produce. That is, I'm not saying that that account is the first time that ever appeared in print, okay? Because obviously, if you look at Dickens and Oliver Twist, there are some accounts of, of a cheerful fireside. What's, what's special about this, what's unique about this, is that this is the first time, and I, I've researched this by going back into as many earlier guides from 1842 as I can. What's unique about this is that it's the first time in a sense of prescription of this is how a home should be in a manual that is specifically trying to detail to people, this is what you should do. That's, that's the first time that it comes into place, okay? Um, Further research in this is, is, is fairly interesting in terms of some differences between England and Scotland. One way we could evaluate the, um, the description from John Ayton is that there's universality to this image that England and Scotland have, have a lot in common. Another way would be to look at whether or not those ideas play out differently in Scotland. And, and there, is, uh, there is one really significant difference that, that has to do more with the setting uh, in Scotland of the kinds of homes that are available. If you're familiar with uh, some of the writings in the 19th century or, or even after, um, housing in Scotland ha has not been looked upon very favorably. In, in 1915, uh, an article by a man named J.W. Smith was trying to sum up the conditions of housing in Scotland at the end of the long 19th century, uh, and, and it was not favorable. And Drummond's thought was really is, uh, helpful in terms of how we can, can look at the differences. He said a home should not just be discussed in terms of four walls and a roof, but in terms of being a home. And, and the implication for that is the family. Aiton uh, added to that idea, he, he was very specific to ministers. He said, the word of command is go marry, sir, and know before you die what the words comfort and kindly feelings mean. Now, the implication from, from Aiton's thought is, if you don't marry, you're not gonna know these things. And so there's an emphasis on family in Scotland as integral to the home. And it's not that the English homes were not aware of family, but the, the focal point of what makes a home is much stronger towards family in Scotland than it is in England. Um, there's a, a later book uh, that was published in Edinburgh in 1860. It's called Homely Hints for the Fireside um, that kind of stresses this point in a different way, uh, suggesting that a family uh, have the cheering habit of looking on the bright side of things, or at least not dwelling on the dark view. Uh, and, and the idea that the family is what makes the home a cheery place and not so much maybe the object culture, which was more emphasized. Uh, in, in some of the English texts about the home. The Scottish authors, Scottish diarists, left uh, quite a trail to suggest that this is true. Uh, a man named Alexander Ballantyne in 1837 noted in his diary one evening that most of the house was dining elsewhere and then said directly, I am left by myself down. Uh, he, he was not very happy with being alone in the home. And that thought was echoed by a schoolboy. Uh, we don't know the name. He never left the name of the diary, but an Edinburgh schoolboy in 1850 who noted that mother and father were out uh, and I am left alone reading the Arabian Nights. In contrast, though, in the schoolboy's diary, several weeks later, he wrote an entry where uh, we went to Aunt Poyd's for tea and had good conversation. It was a fine night. 
and in that you've got this wonderful contrast of, of family versus uh, solitude and, and the way that's significant for the Scottish home. Um, there was a man named William Smith too, uh, writing in the 1880s. He was living uh, far in the north of Scotland, uh, in the north of Inverness actually. Uh, and his son, Billy, went uh, and became a sailor. And his diary for several days is, is disconsolate with the loss. He says, Billy left for Liverpool today, uh, left us at home all very lonely and disconsolate, could hardly realize it as fact. Um, and the next day we were a weary day, all cast out, home still lonely, no heart for anything. Uh, and he repeats that same kind of, of sentiment over several days before finally settling down. So there's other evidence, there's other things that, that we could talk about, but to, to be mindful of, of uh, the purpose of this, Scotland has a, a different focal point in part, arguably, because the homes in Scotland were more marginal, but if you could have that family situation there, um, it, would, it would benefit you and you could still have a happy home. Um, so these are, the, these are the framing elements of this conversation that, that I wanted to have. And, and now I think you know, we can probably properly get into some of the questions that I might want to ask. Um, if I could sit down with this anonymous woman from the middle of the 19th century, for example, one of the things I wanted to know was how seriously did she take the advice from these domestic economy guides? Was this really the way you lived your life? Um, and, and for example, in, in domestic economy guides throughout the period, there's a lot of advice about color and how important it was to have harmonious color. Uh, and this advice got increasingly zealous uh, as, as the time went by. Um, in 1825, one domestic guide commented that uh, about colors in, the, in a room, one's side is absolutely overpowered by the effect of contrasting colors within so small a space, and one's cheeks still in a complete glow from their depth and warmth. So a physical reaction to the colors. Um, around mid-century, Cassell's household guide suggested that middle-class householders could learn how to manage this because the harmony of color is governed by a few fixed laws which are easily understood. And goes on to talk about how important it is uh, to have an elegant room with a pleasing arrangement of colors uh, where no one color is in a struggle for supremacy against another. By the end of the century though, th this advice towards color uh, had gotten a little bit about out of hand, I would suggest. Um, in uh, A Guide to a Healthy and Beautiful Home in 1899, the harmony and coloring of rooms has a strong influence on people who are sensitive to their surroundings. We have now require this physical reaction. If, if the color is wrong, if the wallpaper is wrong, um, you know, you're supposed to react to it. Famously, Oscar Wilde at one point is supposed to have said, uh, either the wallpaper goes or I do, and then he died. That's not actually what he said, but it's a funny, it's a funny connection to it. Um, by the turn of the 20th century, the, the advice had reached a level that was practically unmanageable. Um, in Housekeeping for Two, a practical guide for beginners, even the buying of a sofa cushion. Care should be taken that the colors blend with those surrounding it for one color, just one clashing color, will spoil the effect of an otherwise perfectly arranged and harmonious room. I would think that, that with all of this, 19th century people in their private accounts would register it somewhere. The fact of the matter is very few did, very few even cared. Um, that does not mean that, that you might not have raised an eyebrow or two, but it wasn't enough to leave a written record. It was not enough to leave a trace of emotions history that we could reconstruct. There is one account in the autobiography of Marion Hughes where she noted there, that there were some faded colors in the drawing room she was sitting in, uh, but that it was still in harmony with, with, her, uh, with her overall surroundings. Um, and the, the anonymous Edinburgh schoolboy did discuss at one point just choosing green damask curtains for the, for the drawing room. But really, for all the kerfuffle that was in the guides about uh, color, very few people were really, really put off by it, or at least not enough to leave evidence of it. Um, there are also 
some, some thoughts about particular places. The drawing room does figure prominently in conversations. Um, in terms of advice, uh, according to uh, an early guide from 1825, uh, for the drawing room, it should be neat and exhibit good taste in, de in its decorations and arrangement. Uh, from these, this room, strangers are apt to form an opinion of the character of its proprietor. Uh, and that advice is pretty consistent, actually, throughout the century. Uh, a, a later book by a, a, a regular author of household advice named Lady Barker, uh, she notes that a drawing room should possess an original stamp and style of its own, so that if the visitor found himself alone in it for five minutes and looked around, he would be able to form an idea of the tastes and habits of the family. Diarists did actually uh, account for this to some extent, uh, maybe not as zealously as, as the, the guides would suggest, but there was a man named John Duff, who was actually a professor at Newcastle University, or, or what is now Newcastle University at the time, it was Durham College. Um, but he was a lecturer and then a professor there during the late 19th and, and 20th century. Um, and as he was setting up uh, his home in Newcastle, he commented as they were uh, working on it, the drawing room looked so handsome, and later made a comment to the effect that he was photographed in that drawing room uh, for his representation for his image in Northumberland at the beginning of the 20th century. So clearly, you know, in his mind, that did represent a significant space and expression itself, but maybe, maybe not quite as, as zealous. As, as the guides would, would suggest. Um, the mistress of the home was a key figure here in the moral and emotional well being of the home. She was often referred to as the angel in the house, which is a fundamentally problematic term. It, it implies an angel in the house that there is this powerful, heavenly being placed in a restricted and extremely bounded setting. And, and, and that definitely creates potential problems for this figure that, that is supposed to live up to that. Throughout the 19th century, and, and this is probably not news to anyone, but throughout the 19th century, women were considered to be morally superior, but intellectually and physically inferior. And so the, the moral guidance of women was considered essential, but they lacked the stamina physically and the intellectual capacity necessarily to do that without, without help. And so there was a lot of advice given to women on how they were supposed to be. And needless to say, women did not necessarily react well to this all of the time. Um, one of the guides from 1852 suggests uh, of women that the dreariest prison cell, if visited by a woman's transforming touch, will reflect the feeling of the comfortable parlor which is dubious, but possibly there is still the reference to a woman's touch in, in society. Um, Isabella Beaton's Book of Household Management is more direct. Uh, she noted that woman is the alpha and omega in the government of her establishment. Um, that may to some extent still be true. I, I'm not going to speculate too much on that. I think my wife and I shared these views rather well, thank you. But more tellingly, uh, in 1876, a domestic economy class book for girls at the time that the, the education system was formalized and girls uh, in education were specifically put into a domestic economy curriculum. So this was a wide scale deployment of what girls should do if they were educated. Uh, this textbook suggests women have more to do with success or failure, happiness or misery, learning or ignorance, than kings, statesmen, philosophers, philanthropists, and clergymen. No pressure there. Um, there's a catch, though, and, and, and this is an important one. The same year that that class book came out, uh, a book called The People's Housekeeper suggested that the highest moral quality and the best intentions fail to make a happy home without cleanliness, economy, and order. And therein lies the problem. The risk in all of this is we are linking moral and emotional renewal with the physical drudgery of the home. The emotional well-being of your family has just been connected to whether or not you've polished the fire irons and dusted the, the knickknacks. That 
that created potential conflicts for women. And in real loss, uh, in real life, costs could be quite high. Um, my work has uncovered several accounts of women really struggled with this. They tried very hard to internalize these standards and to live up to the emotional expectations that were being imposed on them. But there was a cost. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, a woman named Anne Frazier, who uh, was up in Northern Scotland, working as a governess at the time, actually. So she was not, properly speaking, she was not the mistress of the home that she was in, but she had a great deal of responsibility for the children in that home. Um, and she lamented in her diary at one point, God forgive me for the too passive part I have acted in this situation. One of more spirit might have been more serviceable to both mother and children. Um, other women were, were even more worried, more concerned. Um, a woman named Elizabeth Hearn, who, who was right here in Newcastle, actually, uh, commented in her diary at one point that my husband seems to have no pleasure in his home and his children do not seem to interest him as they did formerly. As for me, he seems to avoid me and never speaks to me when I can help it. I am miserable, oh, so miserable. I dare not mention my troubles to anyone, not even my sister or my mother. It would grieve them and do me no good. There's the assumption that if her husband is unhappy, it must be her fault and, and there's no one to turn to. Um, it, it, could, it could even reach a point that women would actually do themselves um, physical damage in an effort to live up to, the, to these standards. Uh, there was a woman named Emma Wibberley writing in 1890. Uh, she, at first, you know, she's very focused on the selflessness of this mistress of the home and how she's supposed to put others first emotionally. She wrote, I felt how often I missed an opportunity of doing a kindness when I might so easily give pleasure to others just by putting self aside. That's not particularly new compared to some of our other authors. But she took it to an extreme degree. Um, at one point, she noted she went on a long tricycle ride and came back, quote, very much exhausted. However, mother wanted her tea badly, so I got it ready, then I actually fainted. Uh, she comments later that she spent a few days in bed, but even in her recovery period, she wrote, I would not care so much if it were only myself that had to suffer, but the extra work and anxiety upon, upon mother troubles me very much. Clearly, there is a, a recurrent pattern of women as the focal point in the home, the, the, the angel in the house that is supposed to uphold these, these values and these ideas, um, struggling very much with the emotional expectations within them. There are some comments also regarding the, the, the objects in the home. Um, Domestic guides talk about them in, in, in some detail. There, there are a great many objects described in emotional terms in the home. However, in terms of lived experience, diaries didn't comment on, on nearly as many things. Although the fire, not surprisingly, uh, was a consistent point of, of conversation. Um, in, in 1826, uh, one writer commented to have no fire or a bad fire to sit by is a most dismal thing. In such, a man, in such a state, man and wife must be something out of the common way to be in good humor with each other. Um, and, and in the same year, there was also a comment of the, the problems with the fire. At present, uh, in, in uh, 1827, this author wrote, at present we talk of the comforts of our fireside, when in fact, in one respect, the fireside is the most uncomfortable place in the house, owing to the unusual construction of our chimneys. Uh, goes on to describe in, in some detail the problems of the, the draft and, and the venting, uh, which does kind of echo back to our, to our earlier critique of, of English comfort. For all those concerns, people latched on to the open fire, the fireplace, as being essential. Um, and throughout the, the period, there's a lot of advice on that. Towards the end of the century, a couple of authors noted uh, one in 1897 in a book just called Domestic Economy, the open fireplace not only furnishes a cheerful warmth, but is likewise a valuable purifier of the atmosphere of the room. Um, 
More directly, a, a book called The New Home, written in 1898, suggested that the most attractive feature of an English room is the fireplace. The stove, beloved of our continental neighbors, may give out more heat, but for comfort and appearance combined, nothing equals an open fire. And that, that lasted well past the 19th century, it seems like, in terms of the way that the fire and the heart are pivotal to the home. Now, did real people respond to this? They did in two ways. One was to know when there was no fire, and one was to know when there was a good fire. Um, and Fraser, the woman I mentioned earlier, commented on, on a traveling expedition that we arrived at our lodgings just as it was growing up, found them damp and uncomfortable. We could not get a fire because they had not procured any peats for us. So the, the, the association between fire and comfort is, is fairly there. Likewise, a, a rather acerbic commentator uh, living in London, her name is Mrs. Simpson, uh, described how she, how she was staying at as a, I did not attempt to come down that, that morning until the Blakes had left, as there's no fire until the husband is out of the house. He's a queer man. So the lack of a fire could definitely provoke an emotional reaction in the home. Um, but when, when there was a good fire, there's, there's enough evidence to suggest people were appreciative of it too. Um, the Edinburgh schoolboy at one point commented on getting a new grate for the drawing room and that it looks very elegant. Um, a, a man named William Dunn, who was a shipping clerk here in Newcastle, commented, he had a toothache one day and he wrote in his diary, I thought the most comfortable way was to pass the morning by reading over the fireside. This I did. Then my friend Rob called and we had a comfortable chat until dinner time. So the fire definitely plays a role as an object and it has an emotional relevance to it. Um, more commonly though, people wrote about when there was a problem in the home. Uh, domestic guides could offer very little on faulty objects in the home because it's really hard to plan for. Although there were some comments on uh, having good drainage, uh, how vexing it was to have a chimney that smoked the wrong end. People though were, were much more inclined in their diaries to note when something went wrong in the home and how they felt about it. Water uh, was, was a definite source of concern. Uh, our Mrs. Simpson again in, in London noted in December of 1878 that a pipe burst in the night uh, in, the, in, in, the, uh, in the front and in the afternoon one in the greenhouse flooding Mrs. Reed's bed. Uh, and that evening the, the householder was most cantankerous after these events. Um, a man living in the highlands of Scotland uh, noted a point where the pump broke, the, the well pump rod broke. And so he took the pump rod out and straightened it where it broke off at the box. He then, instead of being particularly put out about the object failure, he notes that his family was distressed by this. He had to send his daughter to go get help and his wife had to go off and find water from another source. And again, I think that's a, a reflection of the Scottish focus on, on the family more, more perhaps than the object. Um, a woman named Frances Hawkins living in North Yorkshire commented at one point in the 1870s that the new boiler never has any hot water in, and she underlined never uh, to, to express her concern. Um, she, she also commented at one point on, on an experience that perhaps some of us can relate to. Um, she had a horrid day. I bothered with the sewing machine all morning, but I couldn't make it stitch. Um, and there's even some, some comments, music is, is a real issue for homes, not music in your home, Music other people are making. Um, a man named William Gatton, also living in North Yorkshire, uh, noted there is a sad nuisance next door in the shape of an organ, which I must say, almost without exaggeration, is going night and day. It is a nasty, monstrous thing. Um, and even Francis Hawkins comes in at one point, the, the piano tutor had to turn them out of the drawing room because it was, it was just too noisy. Um, there are also questions about, about the role of workmen in the home. And in this case, uh, the domestic guides had at least one bit of advice, suggesting uh, in a book from 1860, of all of our domestic worries, workmen in the house are about the worst. Certainly, householders of the middle class might agree with her. Um, when Anne Frazier was moving house at one point early uh, in her career in the 1820s, she noted that um, 
they, they arrived on a Friday and it was some time before we got into any sort of order as we had all the busted painters, chimney sweeps and so on. Uh, and a fortnight later, when the rest of the family arrived, we had just two habitable apartments. Um, John Duff commented something similar in Moving House and when he was a child. Uh, it seems like painters were a problem in the 19th century, I don't know. Um, he said the painters will soon be out now. They should have been done on the 1st of April and here it is the 1st of May. Uh, Duff is also remarkable in, in the, the level of detail he left in his diary about moving into uh, his new home once he had settled in at, at Newcastle. Um, he made several comments about what workmen did or did not do. In, uh, when he was trying to interview workmen, uh, he said most of them, or some of them did not turn up. Uh, when working in the dining room, he found that the laborer was pulling up the flooring uh, and was disposing of the wood all around for beer and money. We had to send the police round to recollect his lost, uh, his lost wood. Um, and again, with the painters, he noted, uh, the painters had screwed that 12 brass hooks for curtain ropes in upside down, so I had to work nearly an hour screwing and re-screwing uh, every one of them. So we have a wide range of experiences that, that people have left as accounts that, again, I'm not proposing that I know exactly how these people felt, but I, can, I think we can say some things in a general way um, about the feel of home. I may not have a working TARDIS to go back and speak face to face with a housewife from the 19th century, uh, but this work has allowed me to get fairly close to having that conversation that I wanted to have. And what I've learned through this conversation is that uh, the British middle class home of the 19th century was often a pleasant place, even if the commodities of the home did not measure up to class standards, which is why I think the Acton Network theory approach to class has been so useful in this work. I learned that the Scottish home was much more family centered than the English home. I've learned that many of the anxieties of the middle class expressed by domestic guide authors about things like color and class representation did not find their way into the records of lived experiences left by householders although women did internalize the nearly impossible standards being imposed on them, often to the detriment of their own mental health and sense of worth. There were some women, however, who did express a satisfaction with their home lives. In short, despite all the faults of a home, despite limited resources, and at times an incredibly distressed mistress of the home, the feel of home was generally still one of comfort, of cheer, and of enjoyment just as the emotions lexicon data suggests. I think that finding serves as an important reminder that we may have more in common with people in the past than we might think. And to me, that's very exciting indeed. Thank you so much for your time this evening.